All right, stand to your feet with me this morning. We're going to get into the Word. Jesus. Hallelujah. We're doing good for time. Praise God. <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm doing good, Pastor Dave. I'm, I'm doing good. Okay. Listen, I just, I want to take, I want to take the next minute or two and just, and just press into the presence of God for a moment. Can we do that? Can we just, just, just one or two minutes? Um, if you pray in the Spirit, you can begin to pray in the Spirit. Uh, you can pray in English. You can pray in Spanish. You can pray in German. You can pray however you want to pray. But for the next one or two minutes, just begin to press in to the presence of God and prepare yourselves to receive what He has for you today. Jesus. Hmm. Hmm. Holy Spirit, move in this place right now. Hmm. Move in this place, Holy Spirit. Jesus, you taught us to pray for, for, for the kingdom to come and God's will to be done. So kingdom come right now. Your will be done right now. Father, we thank you that we know that it is your will to save. It is your will to heal. It is your will to restore. It is your will to comfort. And so, God, I just say your will be done. The will of the Lord be done in this place in Jesus' name. God, I just pray even right now, even as we pray, that, that people who may be standing here uh, in pain, that you would just touch them, even right now. <laughs> even right now, Holy Spirit, that you would begin to move, that you would begin to enlighten people, awaken people, restore people, give people hope, give people peace, give people joy. <laughs> A fresh touch from heaven today, God. A fresh touch for every single person here. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be preaching from verses 20 through 23 this morning. And I want to talk to you for the remainder of my time under the title, Know Where You're Seated. Know Where You're Seated. Because I think if I were to ask the question this morning, where are you sitting? I think I'd get a very excited response saying, Renaissance Church! And what I want you to understand is that while you, you, your, your body may be sitting in Renaissance Church, that's not where you're seated. The first thing, before I can even get into that, the first thing that you have to understand, that, that we need an understanding as believers, is that you are not your body. <laughs> People don't understand this. They, they identify with their body their whole lives, even when they're in Christ. You are not your body. See, Jesus says in John chapter 3, and this is in the context when he's talking to Nicodemus, and he's telling him that he has to be born of the Spirit. He has to be born again, right? And he says in verse 6, John 3, 6, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So church, when you have been born again of the Spirit, you are no longer of the flesh. You are of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.16, uh, Paul says, he says, Therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we regarded Jesus once according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. He says, we, once you have been born again of the Spirit of God, we do not regard you according to your fleshly nature. You see that? The, the very next verse in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, and behold, the new has come. What is the old that has gone? It's you being identified, dominated, and, and, and owned by flesh. And the new that has come is you were born of the Spirit, and now you are a spiritual being. 
it. We have to stop identifying ourselves with our bodies. We are born again believers are the only beings on earth that are not to be identified as fleshly beings. Every animal is a fleshly being. Paul says in, 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 in Ephesians 2 that, that you all just at one point were dead in your trespasses and just lived out your fleshly desires. Right? Before God comes into your life and, and breathes new life into your spirit and you're born again by the spirit, you are simply a fleshly being. But once you're born of the spirit, you have become a spiritual being. You are not your body. Some of you say, praise God for that. <laughs> you are not your body. Paul says earlier in that chapter in 2 Corinthians 5, he, he refers to his body as a tent in which he lives. <laughs> right? See, and he says, he says, well, I'm in this tent. I'm moaning, groan, being burdened. But he says, I know there's going to come a time when I put this tent off. And, and that's as a side note, church, I want you to know, believers never die. <laughs> you will never die. <laughs> the, Jesus says, this is eternal life, to know God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. You, your eternity starts now. <laughs> See, Paul says when he puts off that tent, he's not going to die. He's going to get swallowed up by life. <laughs> We don't die, we get swallowed up by life. And he says, and, and God has prepared for us a, 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 a heavenly building, right? Eternal in the heavens. A, and that is a glorified body that God has prepared for us when we put off this silly tent that we live in right now. But it's important to understand, the reason I'm going a little bit deep into this right now, because it's important to understand, because a lot of people live as if they are their body, they have a soul, and the spirit's out there, and sometimes they have a connection with it. <laughs> when in reality, you are a spiritual being, you are responsible for a soul, and you live in a body. It's a temporary home. You're camping. <laughs> okay? All right, go with me to Ephesians 1. <laughs> Ephesians 1. Thank you. I thought so too. I appreciate that. Ephesians 1, verse 20 through 23. The Bible says that God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So first of all, I want you to see that the Bible is telling us where Jesus is seated, right? It says that God, when after he had been crucified, God the Father raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now, I want you to understand what the right hand represents before I go on. It represents two things. It's the ultimate position of nearness to the Father. You can't get any closer than the right hand. Okay? It's the ultimate position of nearness to the Father, and it's the ultimate position of authority. He, he said, far above. Someone say far above. Far above. Not just a little above. Far above. All rule, all authority, all power, and all dominion, and above every name that is named. Hallelujah. Jesus has been seated in a position of authority. If you can name it, Jesus has authority over it. <laughs> Try to name something, right? Every demonic spirit, both in this age and in the age to come, he says, every demonic spirit, every sickness, every obstacle in your life, every government, Jesus has authority over it. He's been seated in that position. But I got good news for you, church. 
This is where it gets exciting. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 6. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 6 says this. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Let me stop there real quick. Just to emphasize what I talked about earlier a little bit. The, the reality is, is that every single person in this room was at one point dead. If you were your body, that would not be true. <laughs> you were dead in your trespasses. But God has made you alive. That spiritual you has been made alive together with Christ. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, what did God tell them not to do? Don't eat that tree. Right? Don't eat that fruit. Right? And, uh, and, and for whatever, I don't know what they were thinking. You know, they, they went, <laughs> they, they ate the fruit. Right? And, and thanks a lot. Right? Now, now they, they doomed mankind for a long time. Right? And so, and Jesus came to reverse that curse that came. But when they ate that fruit, my question is for you, did they die? Yes, they did. But not physically. Their body didn't die. But they died. And it's only through Jesus that we're brought back to life. Amen? So listen. Verse 6. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you see what the Bible says? It says, God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. And when he did that, he raised us from the dead with him, right? Everyone who would believe in him for salvation has been raised from the dead with him. And he seated Jesus in the heavenly places at his right hand, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So where are you seated, church? You, 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 your butt might be sitting in Renaissance Church, but your spirit, the real you, is seated at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places far above all rule and all authority and all power and all dominion. That's your position. But you gotta know, you got to know where you're seated you got to understand where you're seated because you can be seated there and never live like it. Cool. The reality is, is that every born-again believer is seated there, but not every born-again believer takes advantage of being seated there. Not every born-again believer lives like it, right? Because you got to have that revelation. you got to have that understanding of where you're seated and what it means. I told you already, what does the right hand of the Father represent? It's the ultimate position of nearness. This one blows my mind. Like, like God wanted to be that close to me that he put me there. He wanted me that close to him that he put me at his right hand. I didn't climb the ladder. I didn't climb a stairway to heaven. He picked me up and he put me at his right hand because that's how close he wants me to him. Oh, when you want, and then it's the ultimate position of authority. That's the other thing. When you understand where you're seated, it's going to change everything. It's going to change the way that you walk on this earth. I'm going to give you, there's so many different ways it'll change how you walk on this earth, but I'm going to give you three for time's sake this morning. Amen? The first thing it's going to change, it's going to change the way that you approach God. The sad reality is that we have been trained in the church to approach God from the position of a servant. When God calls us to approach him from the position of a son or a daughter, what's the first thing Jesus says when the disciples say, teach us how to pray? He says, our Father. It, the first thing, if you want to have effective prayers, 
the first thing that you have to understand is that we approach God in prayer as Father. But whether we realize it or not, or not oftentimes we're approaching Him from the position of a servant. Right? And, and let me tell you the difference. A servant is not guaranteed an audience with the Master. Think about it as an employee with your boss. You got to make a meeting. Your boss might say, "I'll meet you. I'll meet you Sunday at 9:30." <laughs> Some of you got that. <laughs> you got to make a meeting, and, and maybe you got to perform at a certain level so that your office got to get closer to the boss. You know, the boss got the corner office, and, and you got to get that, that good quarterly uh, 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 report so that you can get the office closer and get promoted and get promoted and get promoted and get closer so that you have more of an audience with the boss. This is how so many of us approach God, church. If I, if I, if I perform at a certain level, I can have an audience with the king. See, the servant does not remain in the house at all times. The servant lives somewhere else and might visit the house. The son remains in the house at all times. Church, we are called as the sons and daughters of God seated at the right hand of the Father to have constant, unhindered access to the presence of God in our life. And so often we think we got to first pray for an hour to get into the presence, right? Listen, this does not take away the need to pray for an hour. You should still pray for an hour, but you should do it the whole time in the presence. <laughs> okay? You should do it the whole, you should enter in instantly with an understanding, boom, I can be in his presence at any moment. And not, and I'm not talking about just a, a, a philosophical understanding. I'm talking about an experiential understanding that at any moment we're in the presence of God church, you can literally learn, and I'm still learning this more and more, you can learn to walk and live and breathe and be constantly in the presence of your Father. <sighs> Unhindered access. There's this, there's this story, uh, we, we all know the, the, the parable of the prodigal son. You guys know that parable, right? In Luke 15. And, uh, and, and, and you know the story, the, the younger son takes his inheritance, he goes, he wastes it, comes back broken and the father receives him back with love but but what I love about that story is the father's interaction with the older son who never left right because the older son complains and says man how come he gets a cow and I don't get a goat right he goes to his father and complains and I love the father's response listen to what the father says he says two things that tell us so much about the heart of our father the first thing he says to the older son he says my son you are always with me The son has the right to be always with the father. The only time as a son that you don't, aren't with the father is when you take your inheritance and run off and waste it. But you have the constant right to come back and the constant right to be in the presence of your father. He says, my son, you're always with me. The second thing he says to, to the older son, he says, and everything that I have is yours. In other words, he doesn't say, why didn't you ask for a goat? I would have gave you one. He says, the goat was yours to begin with. You could have taken as many goats as you wanted. But the older son didn't know what he had. He didn't know his position, and he didn't know how good his father was. So he thought he couldn't have a goat. So he lived his entire life without a goat. And the Father says, everything I have is yours. Ephesians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In other words, <laughs> my son, my daughter, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places has been given to you by your Father. 
every spiritual blessing in heaven is yours. But if you don't know it, you'll live like the older son and you'll go your whole life without a go. Church, if you need peace this morning, it's yours. <laughs> every spiritual blessing in heaven. <sighs> if you need joy this morning, it's yours. Take it. If you need healing this morning, it's yours. Take it. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. God the Father is saying to us this morning, my sons and my daughters, you are always with me, and everything that I have is yours. Amen. Jesus. Okay, the next thing. The next thing is going to change. I'm doing slightly not as good on time. Okay. The next thing is going to change is going to change the way that you fight. <laughs> when you understand that you're seated at the right hand of the Father and the ultimate position of authority, it's going to change the way that you do spiritual warfare. It's going to change the way that you fight. What I love is, is that uh, Paul says that we, Jesus, and us, within Jesus, are seated at the right hand of the Father, right? Far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, right? He lists those four things. Now, now listen what he says in, in chapter 6 of Ephesians, which is the quintessential spiritual warfare chapter of the New Testament, right? This is the armor of God. If you think of spiritual warfare, you think of Ephesians 6. Listen what he says in verse 12 of Ephesians 6. This is powerful. When I saw this, it changed things for me. Listen what it says. In verse 12, it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and, bu and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness. And then it doesn't say dominion, but against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's dominions, right? So Paul says, what do we wrestle with? We wrestle against rulers, authorities, powers, and dominions. What are we seated above? rulers, powers, authorities, and dominions. So, church, you must, in this life, we do wrestle. We have spiritual warfare, but you got to know the position you fight from. You fight from above. You don't, the only way the devil can beat you up is if you get on his level. The devil was never given the right to beat you up as a child of God. The only way he can do it is if you get on his level. The, it also says in that, in that passage that Jesus is the head of the body, which is his church, and, and everything else is put under his feet. So if we're the body, and everything's under our feet, what does that tell you? Every, everything else is under the lowliest part of the church. Whatever in your mind the lowliest part of the church is, maybe it's your... Maybe it's, it's the new convert, right? Maybe it's, it's the, the, your teenage son, right? Whatever you think, whatever you think the lowliest part of the church is, everything else is under their feet. That's the position that we've been given, church. So yeah, we wrestle. Do you want to see how we wrestle? That's how we wrestle. Amen? Listen, it's not a fair fight. Quit acting like it's a fair fight. Quit acting like it's a fair fight, right? But listen, Nathan, if we were to get in a fist fight, I realize you wouldn't have a chance anyways just because of my size. But if we were to get in a fist fight and you started on the ground on your back with my foot on your face, you think you got a shot? And also I forgot there's a rule you can't get off your back. You, you got to remain on your back under my foot. You got a shot? Do you, no, you, you do got a shot, but you know how? If, if I don't know that and I lay down next to you. The only way the devil has a shot against you is if you don't know your position and you lay down next to him. The Bible says that your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion. He's not a lion. Jesus is a lion. But he prowls around like one. And 
and it says he's seeking whom he may devour. Why does he have to seek whom he may devour? Because he can't devour everyone. I said the devil can't devour everyone. The, the only way he can devour you is if you lay down next to him and say, go ahead, devil. <laughs> when you know your position, when you know that you are seated at the right hand of the Father, far above him, not a little above him, far above him, far above all rule and power and, and authority and dominion and above every name that is named, it'll change the way that you fight. And understand, it's not because you're special, it's because you're seated in Christ. You are seated. You are in Christ. The Bible says, uh, whoever has been baptized into Christ has put on Christ. You are in Christ. You're walking through this world with a Jesus uniform. Right? So the, the, de the devil sees you coming. He's not scared of you. He's scared of your uniform. Yeah, he can't help but bow to the uniform. He can't help to bow to the Jesus that is on you, the Jesus that you're in, because you're seated at the right hand of the Father in Christ. Amen? It will change the way that you fight. That's the last thing. I'm, 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 I'm going to be brief with this one. <laughs> the last thing that's going to change is going to change the way that you pray. It will, like, literally your prayers will be different. Because we very often pray a servant's prayer. A servant's prayer is begging for the, for the favor of the master. A servant's prayer is from earth to heaven because the servant does not remain in the house. The prayer of a son and a daughter seated at the right hand of God is from heaven to earth. When you begin to pray from heaven to earth, your prayers look different and have a different level of effectiveness. Sometimes, church, the only thing that you need to have the appropriate level of faith to see the breakthrough is a change of perspective. <laughs> if you were to walk to the base of Mount Washington this evening and look up at Mount Washington, right? You, you would say, how am I supposed to command this thing into the ocean? <laughs> this thing is huge. The, the obstacle's too big. Look how big this thing is. Why? Because you're from Earth's perspective. If you were to look at Mount Washington from Heaven's perspective, from the right hand of the Father, right? Is this big? And your prayer becomes move. <laughs> Get out the way. Go away. Move. Because you had that perspective change. There, church, it is a powerful thing to pray from the place where answered prayers come from. a powerful thing to pray from the place where answered prayers come from. Where does every good and perfect gift come from? It comes down from above, coming down from the Father of lights. When you learn to pray from where the answer comes from, it has a different level of effectiveness. The apostles all understood that. That's why the apostles' prayers look different. Imagine, Nathan, if Peter walked up uh, to, to the man laying at the, gate of the, uh, at the gate of beautiful and prayed some of the prayers that we hear in church. <laughs> oh, man. He kneeled down beside him. And he said, God, if you're not too busy, way up there in heaven, would you please look down on me? Would you please hear my prayer? Please, God, please hear my prayer. Would you, would you give this guy some food today? <laughs> Maybe make him feel a little better. Or my favorite one is give the doctor wisdom. Ouch. Sorry. Sorry. 
but we'll, but we're praying to the great physician to give the little physician wisdom, man. I'd just rather pray for healing, you know. <laughs> but no, what does he do? Because he knows his position. He says, "Silver and gold, I don't have, but what I have, I give to you." In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And immediately the man leapt up and began to praise God. It's a different prayer. It's the difference between a prayer of a servant and a prayer of a son. It's the difference of a prayer from earth and a prayer from heaven. You guys with me this morning? I know, I, I like went super deep today, but I know you guys can take it. I know you guys can handle it. It, uh, but but it's so important that we get this church. And one thing that I've just started doing, even just recently, is I've always instinctually, when I talked when I talked to God in the past throughout my day, I'd go like this. Right? It's, it's what I've been taught. Right? He's way up there. I gotta look up. Maybe maybe if I look up, the trajectory of my voice will carry, <laughs> and it might reach him up there. Right? But I've literally purposefully changed that. So now when I go to talk to my father throughout the day, I look to my left. <laughs> it's, it, it's not like there's any, any like, uh, like crazy power to, to my, my neck turning that way, right? But it's a reminder to myself every time I pray where I'm seated. That I'm seated in the ultimate position of nearness to my father. And I'm seated in the ultimate position of authority over the devil. Every time, yeah, you could try that. You, you take it. If you like it, take it. Make it yours. Whenever you pray, whenever you talk to the Father, look to your left. Okay, God, here we go. Okay, Father. Because we have to understand our position, church. When you understand that, when you start to get that revelation, understand where you're seated, the nearness you have to God, and the position over the devil he's given you, it will change. Devil won't be able to beat you up. <laughs> he will, he'll still try. He's gonna lay on his back, punching upwards. You know, he'll still try, but he won't be able to beat you up. When you understand that, you won't feel like you have to beg and contend for the presence of God. Hallelujah! And it's gonna change the way you live your life. Stand to your feet. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I want to have two, two different altar calls this morning. Um, I saved some time, right? Yes! Oh my goodness. I did awesome. Okay. <laughs> you have no idea how hard it is for me to preach quick. Okay, good. I want to have two different altar calls this morning, okay? The, the first thing that I want to do um, is because I don't know everybody in this room. I don't know where you're at with the Lord. I don't know if you have a relationship with right? And if you're here this morning and you say, I don't think I have a relationship with God as my father, that changes today. Because I'm going to introduce you to him. Because <laughs> I'm at his right hand, man. I can introduce you to him. <sighs> so if you're here and you say, man, I, I need to be introduced to the father today. Listen to what the Bible says right after that in Ephesians 2. After what we read in Ephesians 2, the very next verses say this. It says, so that, so we've been seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that, this is why, in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. That's why he did it. So he could show us how good he is. Right? And then it says, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's a gift from God, not as a result, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 